for people to join us. Um, we'll be starting in, in just a minute or so. Um, I am uh, displaying a Slido poll that we're going to start off um, today with. So um, feel free to go to slido.com and then um, copy in this number, 1387407. Um, and, uh, and, um, go ahead and, and, uh, let us know what, uh, if you've already started using MET Plus, what is the hardest part of starting with MET Plus? Or if you haven't quite started, um, you know, using MET Plus, what's stopping you from getting started with MET Plus and, and pick up to three. And, um, we're going to just kind of sit here waiting for people to, to join us and, and, uh, Go ahead and, and take this poll and uh, in about uh, four or five minutes, um, we'll see what, uh, what has come out of this and um, start off our day. So. This is the joy of online polling. We can see what comes up. Hey Tara, the uh, QR code is a little blurry for the screen to, to pick on the cameras. Is there a way to make it a little clearer? Um, you know, I, I don't know. We had problems with, with my screen. Uh, wait, hang on, one, seven, eight, eight, seven, two. Uh, I think the only thing I could try and do is uh, I'm gonna put in in chat the link to it. Maybe can you can you go to it from there? That works. Got it. Thank you so much. All right, for those that are joining us, uh, we're taking a few minutes to um, just kind of take a poll. We're, uh, one of the things that we're trying to get from this workshop is not only building a sense of community within the MET Plus um, users group, but also um, you know, get information on how uh, the MET Plus team can better serve the community. Um, so we're uh, taking a poll here to um, if you've already started using MET Plus, um, what's, you know, um, let us know what the hardest part of getting started with MET Plus is, or if you're not quite started and you can't quite, um, you know, figure out how to, to get started, go ahead and, and tell us what is stopping you. And uh, we're going to leave this um, open, this survey open for another three minutes, um, and then we will uh, get going from there. While we're taking the survey, um, are there any uh, questions that came up from yesterday that uh, someone would like to ask a for some clarification on? And just so you can see, there's lots of different options. All right. It's good to know that finding user support is not standing in people's way right now. If you're just joining us, um, I'm putting in the chat once again, a link to the Slido poll that we're taking at this moment. Uh, it'll be open for a couple more minutes. Basically, just trying to get a sense of what's the hardest part of getting started with MET Plus, whether you have already um, started using it or if you are thinking about starting to use it.
Could you elaborate on what you mean by setting up the config files for, is that talking about like using Met Plus itself or exactly what are you trying to Met for that? Yeah, setting up either the, the configuration files for Met Plus, which is, you know, telling, uh, basically uh, telling um, Met Plus what fields you would like to evaluate um, over what time periods, um, possibly with what masking regions, uh, you know, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, so typically, you know, you would set those up in order, in order to, um, to run Met Plus and, and have it cycle through and do all of the, um, the verification activities that you're requesting from the tools. Gotcha, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we're five minutes in. Um, I, uh, I will go ahead and leave this open for uh, another um, few minutes, uh, but basically it looks like um, we still have a lot of work to do on installation. We're not uh, completely surprised um, to see that. We have just recently taken some steps um, towards trying to make installation easier in the sense of restructuring the, the MET um, uh, repository so that it's easier to, um, you know, just grab um, the, the code base from GitHub and, and so forth. Um, you know, there's a lot of dependencies with um, the MET Plus installation uh, in, because of trying to take advantage of third-party libraries rather than, um, you know, uh, reinventing the wheel um, and so forth. So uh, we will continue to, to look at ways to um, try and improve installation. Um, as far as difficulty with setting up config files, um, you know, we'll, the, the next phase of this survey will be asking people um, if they have any ideas on how we can um, improve upon, um, say for instance, our documentation to make it easier to set up config files. Um, being intimidated by the complexity, also a valid um, point. Uh, however, once you get up the learning curve, we've heard that uh, many people um, enjoy how flexible it is and, and you know, uh, whether they can, um, uh, you know, just easily add in new verification capability. Um, and then confusing, unclear, missing documentation. Uh, clearly we need to, um, you know, have some more discussions about that. Python package dependencies, um, that is a challenge, I think, across the board for um, many um, uh, tools, especially when you're trying to uh, address the needs of, of quite a diverse um, uh, population and, and community. Understanding what statistics to use, yeah. So, okay, um, so just in the interest of time, um, we, uh, I'm going to go ahead and switch gears here and uh, bring up the workshop agenda. So we are now on day two. We had a great set of sessions yesterday um, as well as talking about how to contribute to MET Plus um, and you know, just seeing an overview of what MET Plus is. Um, we, are, um, we already have the, the recordings from yesterday processed. We're waiting for um, just one or two more um, uh, presenters to um, be able to give us permission to post um, and so hopefully we will have the, the presentations from um, yesterday posted by later today. Um, so at this point however um, we're going to go ahead and break out into um, two parallel sessions. Um, session six will remain in this um, particular Google Meet um, and that is um, focused in on um, some of the te technical aspects of how um, uh, more of the operational centers are uh, are using um, Met Plus um, to uh, you know uh, either uh, evaluate their operational system or work on you know developing new systems and so forth. Over in session um, seven, we're, we will be having a continuation of um, uh, kind of looking at feature based um, verification with a twist on. Um, sub-seasonal to seasonal to begin with, and then um, just kind of looking at how you can look for systematic errors. Um, so at this point, go ahead and either stay here or go, um, go over to um, session seven. Um, at, uh, when, when the sessions are done, um, then at about 10.05, we'll take a break. 
And then at 10.30, we'll come back into this um, particular meeting, and I'll be going over um, the metrics workshop and um, talking about how we <coughs> how we um, work through the metrics workshop and what our findings were. So see you all back here at 10.30. Thanks. <laughs> and so, Logan, are you um, online and ready to take take over this um, session? Yep, I'm here, Tara. Spectacular. Take it away. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to this session. I won't go through the introduction again since uh, Tara already gave uh, an overview of, of what this session is for. Um, so we'll start uh, with our first speaker, um, apologies if I don't get your name quite right. Uh, Kandapali Kumar from INCAR uh, will be speaking about operational implementation of the MET package for multimodal evaluation at NCM RWF. Uh, yeah, hi. I think hi, we have the there is a typo error. And I'm not from NCAR, actually, I'm from NCM RWF. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. And, Sorry, and you spelled my name correct. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So shall I share my presentation? Yes. Yeah, and I've updated the affiliation. Our apologies for getting that wrong. It was a, a cut and paste issue, I think. Sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, uh, yeah. Are you seeing my screen? No? Yes, we're able to see it. And slides are moving, right? Correct, yes. Perfect. Okay, yeah. hi everyone. So I am uh, Niranjan. Uh, I'm a working as a scientist here at NCMRWF. And uh, so basically, I, uh, I, I'll talk about on implementation of uh, the MET MET Plus package uh, uh, at our NCMRWF. And we are running a several models here, operational models every day. So I think MET Plus is a very one stop tool for us, and it is an extensive tool. And uh, really, it is great. And I acknowledge all this MET Plus team for bringing this. Uh, good package to us and I acknowledge also my colleagues uh, uh, I gave here so uh, I mean their efforts in some technical difficulties whenever I'm encountering uh, during my implementation so yeah so so my outline of my talk is like this so I just basically give some brief description about uh, some of the current operational models at NCMRWF and uh, also what type of version we are using currently at uh, at our center and also some of the objectives or um, in a long range also perspective also I'm giving here. Um, and while also I give some handling of our uh, model forecast because MET has a certain uh, to give, we have to uh, convert it to certain format. So we are uh, doing in-house, currently we are doing some in-house uh, codes uh, scripting for us, but basically MET Plus is also doing good. We are also using that also, but I'll give some of the handling of our model forecast data uh here and also some uh, demonstration of some output with some examples i'll give so this is how my flow of talk and uh, yeah this slide gives you the our seamless modeling system so ours is based on uh um based modeling system uh and uh, we are running several models actually one is uh, right from 330 meters concentrating to on delhi uh to i think like global coupled system like which is 60 kilometers. So there are uh, regional model 1.5 kilometers and 4 kilometers regional model, uh, which we run every day. This is a box of that uh, uh, regional model uh, thing. And also 12 kilometers global model we run every day, which uh, gives 10 day forecast. And also some sort of ensemble prediction system also we are running every day. So all these uh, com uh, models are seamless. I mean, same dynamical core is, has been used. Uh, now, currently, the efforts are because we have some conventional verification system. Now we are um, uh, in in uh, in process of uh, replacing that conventional thing verification system with uh, MET 10 MET plus because it's very useful tool actually. So the configuration details of uh, various operational models at our center, like uh, global model which is at 12 kilometers and uh, regional model at uh, 4 kilometers, and we have also GFS uh, running and also UCAMBO which we receive data every day uh, from MET office, so which is a uh, six day. Uh, forecast length. Uh, so these are some of the configurations. I'm not going to details of these uh, models, but these are the some of the operational models uh, which I have currently we are implemented, uh, tested implementation of MET and MET plus packages. So we have also several other models like WARF and uh, NCEP uh, that also we are uh, we have the data, but uh, sooner or later we will implement those verification system also here. Now, yeah, as, as I said, uh, we receive model forecast of UK model every day. We are not running here. 
so uh, the technical uh, details of uh, what mat plus uh, version we are using uh, we are using mat 10.0 uh, thing and also mat plus 4 we are using and also like a lot of uh, dependencies we have already uh, thanks to our uh, mihir hpc team they have installed a lot of dependencies and uh, they have struggled a lot while installing all these uh, mat viewer and mat uh, calpe and other mat express and all these things so so these are uh, basic uh, versions we are using uh, for our current operational implementation uh, now uh, the basic objectives uh, really as a meta is a powerful package because it is extremely useful because at one stop we can uh, uh, verify all these um, sim uh, seamless modeling system for example and multimodal verification system uh, and uh, also we are now currently implement, uh, implementing this ensemble verification i just gave the talk uh, tomorrow by dr anameha so from ncmrw we she is going to talk about the ensemble verification and uh, sub, we have also running sub seasonal to seasonal verification system because our external range will give you will gives the four week uh, forecast so which we have had to start to implement uh, met and met packets for that and we are also verifying severe weather verification system uh, using MET and MET Plus. So my colleagues, Dr. Harvir and uh, tomorrow talks by Mohan, uh, will give you the about the details of this, some of the severe weather verification systems at Ansem Arrowlift. And now currently we have also implemented the sub-daily verification system uh, using MET. So that also I'll, I'm going to talk about a few slides on that. And uh, apart from that, so we are also concentrating on the regional verification system using spatial masking. So we, which is a beautiful tool in MET. Uh, so because at once, one stop, we can all uh, verify at several sub subdomains. So for example, this is a whole domain. And now this is an Indian region. We are now uh, verifying uh, both these domains. And also our focus will be next on very subdomain region like you know Mumbai and uh, some urban cities because our model has a, a very high resolution system so we can actually verify these type of uh, small domains so this mask is spatial masking is a very useful tool and this is particularly useful for our integrated flood warning system for mumbai so we want to verify those uh, regularly for mumbai uh, region so this is our plan of uh, action so i mean uh, we verify full domain and uh, we cut it to indian region and we cut it to subdomain regions and later we extend whatever the regions we are interested so basically, this, uh, this is a tool, uh, GenVex, I think uh, many of the you know that. This is a very good tool to whatever the domain you want to choose, you can choose. And you can verify and stats will be generated for that particular region. So here I'm showing uh, some small Indian, uh, some Indian, Indian domain, which we, we are verifying, and also full domain. So just create once for the whatever masks, whatever the region we want. So uh, I just give an example here how the um, Gen mask tool gives. So this is a whole domain and now Indian domain we are verifying here. This is a day one forecast, day three and day five, how our NCOMG is performing at various grid resolutions. Now going to full domain to Mumbai. And uh, the output will be like this. You, you are verifying when you are verifying uh, using GenVex uh, mask tool. So you'll get full resolution and India domain and also whatever the region you want to choose, you can choose that. Now, uh, how we are handling our output. So. So basically, there is a two-stage process here uh, because our meta output is uh, model output is like PP format. Uh, it is property software of MetaOffice, so which we are converting through UM Rider and also some MATLAB wrapper we have made uh, to give uh, the right uh, way of giving to MET because um, this this is how we actually provide the input to the uh, MET. And now after creating this uh, um, observation analysis to the same grid using the using these wrappers. And we we we, can, we are using both MAT plus because both we are in either we can give command from direct MAT or you can give MAT through MAT plus wrapper configuration file. So both the both the things we can give. So both are working for us after uh, give, after creating the input data like this using these two wrappers. And currently I am we are using grid set and mode for this multimodal thing. And uh, the plotting and graphics I think we already MAT has several. Uh, uh, packages met plot by and met uh, several things but currently we are using met clothes in house uh, built uh, met codes matlab codes so because it is our way of doing what we want to show to the users and like that so in i think sooner or later we will actually go to the met plot by and uh, other met plus packages uh, which is end to end implementation of met plus now uh, i just show the this is a basic uh, input data set how we are creating so we are uh, i think met uh, you can actually verify two ways one is the initial timing based and also valid time so here a valid date i am giving and all these valid forecast days for uh, pre from pre previous for previous day forecast uh, we are creating and now we are, we are verifying and we are in giving input to the met okay, this is the output how we are getting using grid strategy 
Now, basically, I, I'm, I'm not going to spend on much on this because all these extensive uh, literature is given by the Met uh, Red uh, in this website. So there are several ways of uh, in uh, invest verifying the grid stats, like your Fourier, Fourier decomposition, neighborhood method. And all these methods are extensively given in that website, and um, the measures basically categorical, continuous, and probabilistic. I'll show here basically on categorical score because it is only for demonstrating purpose i'm not going to details of uh, all these uh, measures but i just give some basics of basic uh, figures about these uh, plots so i i am going to show you like um, like whatever the grid stat output we are getting through met like pod fr some basic skill scores to complex skill scores all these scores met is providing so i i'm uh, in this talk i'll just go into three, these three uh, these three uh, measures categorical scores so uh, how we are demonstrating uh, met output some examples so actually this uh, we are verifying multimodal uh, like gfs you can all these things based on currently only surface fields we are uh, using like 10 meters wind surface temperature and 2 meter temperature and other mslp i think yesterday my colleague has shown the rainfall thing so we are integrating all these surface fields into our multimodal verification system uh, uh, very soon so we are uh, measuring this categorical scores and uh, i just show for demonstration purpose some thresholds we are uh, we are choosing it is only for purely demonstration purpose and we are still finalizing what thresholds we want to choose for each of the variable and uh, I'm, I'm just show some sub daily verification of met output both grid and mode uh, what is our objective like event based forecast verification and uh, uh, we want to use uh, like a particular event we want to give some uh, verification and also the, how our model is performing on based on monthly and seasonal so all these things we our idea is uh, like this i mean based on event based forecast verification using met and also uh, in a long term like monthly how our model is performing and in a seasonal way so these yeah. two so, so this is one yes sir. you have about two minutes left oh yeah 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 sure okay. thank, thank you. you so i uh, yeah i just came to results so this is one of the output uh, which uh, grid will give so it is very useful for day to day evaluation of different models which proves the which uh, 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 very uh, informative for uh, model developers because as you can see that uh, the warm bias is increasing uh, in all these models uh, like uh, you know this is an income global model imd gfs and ucamo so all these models every day day to day evaluation of these forecast system based on met is very useful and this plot and this is just to give you idea of categorical verification of 10 meter wind and how we are we want to showcase the met output uh, at our center and this is basically on, as I said, monthly and seasonal charts. So this is how our whole month, how it is, how the different models are performing. Like for example, this NCOMG and IMDGFS, how our model is performing uh, for, I think I have shown here uh, two meter relative humidity here. So these charts are useful for our monthly and seasonal reports, which we uh, disseminate regularly uh, to show the model performance at our center. So other one is I'm talking about the sub daily verification. So currently the rainfall verification only is made operational for sub daily. So basically I'm using multi uh, image data pro image product for verification uh, for getting the scores using grid set and mode. Uh, this is one plot which shows the, the ba based on various thresholds. So how the grid stat output will show at 24 hour forecast, 48 hour and 72 hour forecast for valid time. So as you can see that higher rainfall uh, thresholds are not, uh, skill is not good, model skill is not per, uh, good uh, in all these models. So other way of showcasing our, uh, the meta grid state output is like, you know, this uh, uh, forecast based on forecast length. So all these, because our models are running, uh, regional model is running for 72 hours. So we, we are running, uh, we, we want to show that 72 hours how the model is uh, verified. So this is one way of showcasing. And uh, this is one particular event-based forecast verification we want to see um, uh, show. So this is one thing, uh, a convective system, which usually happens in monsoon region, so which is moving eastward. And uh, we want to show this, how the how these models are performing for these specific events. So there is one more thing also you have, you can see that this event is uh, a Western disturbance uh, during that period. And we have a convective system, which is moving eastward. And how these systems are actually at a sub daily scale, how our models are performing. This is what we want to access from the uh, meta output. So this is, uh, as you can see that this is, uh, this particular Western disturbance is missing now regional model this is where you can the, the missed ones are shown in blue color so this event was missed in uh, this is a regional model which is missed actually but our global model is picked up this western disturbance and while the convective scale event is uh, nicely predicted in regional model which is not uh, picked in the global model so this is one one way we want to showcase uh, how our models are performing on day to day basis and uh, you know as I met actually yesterday my colleague told that there are several um, mode stats is given by the met output so we want to verify each and every day to day how how these uh, global and convective scale model our convective regional scale model is performing um, in resolving these uh, scales 
so this is our objectives and uh, we have to go way forward I think we have to comprehensively evaluate all these model forecasts because currently we have only uh, implemented few tools like there are several tools uh, which wavelet st stats and there are several tools uh, Matt is providing which we want to use and also about a graphic display of method how we want to show the complex uh, stats in a simple way uh, to the users this is what we are now uh, very uh, seeing in our center and also based on as i said choosing thresholds for verification like for example another uh, thing we are going is end-to-end -end implementation using matplace currently we are using some in-house built uh, wrapper uh, matlab wrapper for multimodal verification but we want to implement through this through met uh, met and matplace uh, still we are facing some issue with the met viewer but our um, uh, team is uh, doing for that because we are especially getting some issue with the uh, uh, meta output with coupling with sql database i think our um, technical team is uh, doing this uh, soon we will rectify this also and other one is we want to integrate our metaplus package through rose and sil because this is a wrapper which our actual model runs so directly we want to include uh, integrate that uh, our this uh, Met, metaplus uh, to the rose and sil and further we support the metplus team in developing new tools like for example as yesterday discussing like uh, process based verification and like energetics how the kinetic and spectrum these are several tools which uh, whenever the model is upgrade upgrade takes place so we want to verify those things so we want to support metplus team in future for developing new tools uh, and thank you all right thank you very much for that excellent talk um yeah. We have to move on in, in the interest of time, but there are a few questions in the chat uh, if you'd like to field those. Um, yeah. While we move on to our next speaker, um, Mallory Rowe uh, from NOAA EMC, uh, she's going to be discussing verification of the GFS and other international global deterministic models at EMC. Take it away, Mallory. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, cool. Step one. Uh, step two is the presentation. And everything looks okay? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So, like Logan said, I will be discussing how we utilize MetPlus here at EMC in order to verify the GFS and other international, international global deterministic models. So kind of looking at a history here of verification at EMC, um, in the more distant past, we had been using a system known as VSDB or Verification Statistics Database to verify the GFS and other international global deterministic models. Um, and what VSDB would do would, um, it would compute statistics and then create various types of verification plots from the statistics and it would do this using Fortran and Graph. Um, more recently, there's been a push across the U.S. numerical weather prediction community to um, work towards moving uh, toward a unified forecast system. And in the end, MetPlus is what was chosen as this verification system. So back in 2019, uh, we started a transition to MetPlus uh, to use to verify our global deterministic model. And now today, uh, we have a new MetPlus based verification package that's called MCBerif Global that has entirely replaced VSDB. So what is uh, MCBerif Global? Um, it does everything, like I said, that VSDB had done. Um, it replicates it and it does that, but it uses MetPlus and Python instead of Fortran and Grads. Just as uh, the MetPlus wrappers are a wrapper around Met, I've kind of started lovingly referring to EMC Verif Global as a larger wrapper around MetPlus. Um, and so what EMC Verif Global does, um, you know, it does a lot of things. It will load modules depending on what machine you're on, uh, gather the appropriate data files, create output directories, um, submit jobs to the queue to run, uh, and then create and run job scripts that actually do the running of MetPlus. Um, it will archive any dot files um, that are produced from MetPlus and even send those files to MetViewer to load into a database. Um, you know, if you're running plots, it will generate plots and then take those along with a web page template to send to a web server so you're able to view the plots that were created. And then it'll just do a cleanup um, at the end of everything when it runs. So the last two bullet points here, the first is um, uh, the link to the main EMC Verif Global repository on GitHub. 
And then the second is the ENC Verif Global Wiki that is housed on uh, GitHub as well. So how does ENC Verif Global use MetPlus? So we'll start with um, the configuration file. ENC Verif Global has its own configuration file. Um, our users will select, um, you know, the type of verification or use case that they want to run, and then along with that, um, they'll set up some associated settings for what they're looking to run. Um, for example, like forecast hours, um, initialization cycles, valid hours, you know, the, the name of the model that you want to run, where the forecast files are, et cetera. Um, and so since the goal of this, or this whole point of this workshop is MetPlus. I don't want to dive into the details of how EMC Verif Global really runs or the details of the configuration file. Um, so if you're curious about that, again, check out the GitHub, check out the wiki. Um, there's a link there to the configuration file if you're curious to what is all in that. But when EMC Verif Global is run, this configuration file gets sourced which has essentially set the configuration uh, settings in that file as environment variable. And then as, as EMC Verif Global is going through and running, it will use these environment variables then to create job scripts. And in each job script, each job script <laughs> will see, um, you know, a long list of environment variables along with, um, you know, either a call or call to run MetPlus. Um, so I'm gonna have some screenshots in the coming slides of what um, MetPlus configuration files look like that are being used. Um, I just want to note that EMC Verif Global is using Met version 9.1 and MetPlus version 6.1.1, which are um, one version number behind. Um, so some things you may see in the screenshots of the configuration setting uh, names might be uh, declared no longer supported in MetPlus. So just something that I wanted to note there. So for our daily verification here at EMC, uh, we have two parts. So the first part is just to compute the verification statistics using EMC Verif Global. And then once we have the verification statistics, we can go ahead and run step two, which just produces um, the verification graphics. And we do this for the GFS and other international global deterministic models. And for this presentation, I'm going to focus on the grid-to-grid -grid verification in EMC Verif Global. Um, so when I say grid to grid, I mean we're comparing the model gridded forecast to the model gridded analysis. So here is a list of all the uh, models that we verify every day here at EMC. Um, um, there's about, I think, eight, if I recall. Um, so it's a lot, of, a lot of processing that we do um, to get those verification, verification statistics and graphics done here every day. So here is my little flow chart um, for the grid for grid to grid verification for step one to generate the stat. So again, you start with your grid uh, model forecast data, your grid model analysis data, and that is fed into grid stat. And from grid stat, we're, um, I have it set to produce a dot stat file. Um, so we'll get, you know, um, for each forecast hour. And then to kind of connect things down, we run stat analysis in order to get things together into one nice big uh, file. And once we have that, um, we can send it up to MetViewer, our um, MetViewer AWS instance, um, and load that file into a database. And then we also maintain a um, local archive of the um, MetPlus uh, stat file. Um, on our local supercomputer. So here is an example of one of the job scripts that I had mentioned that gets produced from EMC Verif Global. Um, this is for computing grid-to-grid -grid stats for the GFS. Um, the screen charts aren't the best, so if your screen's blurry, it probably looks pretty awful. Um, I'll just kind of describe, you know, what we see here. Um, so we have a red box and it's circle or it has a square around an environment variable called home met plus, which is just uh, the path to uh, the location of that plus on the machine. And then we have a yellow box here that is just a list of all the forecast hours to verify. And then those are just a few things, a bunch 
amongst a bunch of environment variables within the job script. And then after those environment variables, um, we have three calls to um, plus. And so you can see there are two configuration files that get passed in each call. Uh, the first configuration file that gets passed is just a general um, machine use case file that um, I'll talk about here in a second. And then uh, the second is uh, specific to uh, the verification use case that's being run. So here is that general uh, machine configuration file. Um, again, it's just pretty basic, some general things. Um, but if you remember in the last uh, slide, there was that red box uh, around the Met Plus path uh, for an environment variable called Home Met Plus. And you can see here how we have use of um, Plus's ability in our configuration files to uh, reference environment variables. We're using that here to that um, that space. And then looking at um, the uh, use case file here, um, we have um, grid staff set up to run uh, by valid time, so going backwards in time to the back stage. Again, here you can see a lot of use of environment variables here that were set in the job script. Um, if you remember that yellow box, that was around all the forecast hours that we want to verify. So you can see that being referenced here. So after we run that, like I said, we'll run stat to kind of gather everything together. So that is what um, these screenshots are for that configuration file. And then, like I said, we will send the data up to uh, the MetViewer AWS server here. So here's an example of uh, you know, the loading being done to the server, and then um, an example XML file for that. So we will do all that uh, verification uh, for the step one step generation for the GFS, as well as all the um, other international global deterministic models that we get data for uh, here at EMC. So again, like I said, another part of step one is archiving the dot files to archive on the machine. And so now we have, you know, a group of uh, .stat files that get produced that first step in a data archive. So now we can go ahead and look at uh, producing verification plots um, to compare models over a given period of time. And for the operational GFS verification, um, for our grid-to-grid -grid plots, we do last uh, 31 days. So here is the flowchart for uh, the grid-to-grid -grid verification step two plot generation. So again, we have that data archive with all the files in there. We take that and we, again, we put that through set analysis. This time, instead of putting things all together into one file, we're doing a lot of filtering um, to get things down to a more individualized level, like with, um, you know, forecast lead, variable name, uh, verification region, um, you know, variable level, et cetera, et cetera. And once we have that filtering done through stat analysis, we'll go ahead and read those files in um, with Python plotting scripts to produce plots. And then once the plots are all generation or generated, we'll go through and copy them up to um, our web server so they can be displayed on our website. So here is an example of a job script from AMC Verflowable uh, to produce some grid to grid plots. Um, again, there's a lot of environment variables here. Um, a lot even for the sciences, uh, in this case, we're verifying eight total models against each other. Um, but here you can see in this red box, we have a variable called forecast bar name, which is sent to HDT, which is geopotential height. Um, in this yellow box here, we have VX map, which is an AX, or um, a sort of abbreviation we use here at EMC for Northern Hemisphere. So then after all those environment variables get set, we have a um, call to Met Plus to run uh, stat analysis to do all the filtering for all of those models. And here is that configuration file. So then uh, you can see all the references, the environment variables that were set in job script. And you can see here forecast bar one name is referencing the forecast bar name environment variable. BX mask is referencing that BX mask um, environment variable. So 
analysis will go through and filter the files for all eight models for um, all the different settings that we have requested. And like I said, once we have uh, that analysis done, then we'll go ahead and use uh, those files to generate all our plots uh, using Python. So here is um, a screenshot of the GFS verification web page. The link is in the presentation, but after I'm done sharing my screen and presenting and whatnot, I'll go ahead and copy it into the chat so you can um, click on it. So you can see here, you'll be taken to this homepage once you click that link. Um, and the whole focus of this presentation was the grid-to-grid -grid, uh, verification of GFS and other international models. So if you were to click that tab, you would get this little pop-out window menu thing uh, with a list of different statistics to see plots for. Um, so, you know, if you click anomaly correlation coefficient, you'd be taken to this page um, with some drop-down menus you can use to navigate different um, variables, regions, et cetera. Um, you can see here the plot um, that was created for marine step two. You can see the GFS in the black line and other various international models um, in some different colors. Hey, Mallory, you have about huh? two minutes left. Perfect. <laughs> um, so, in summary, EMC Verif Global is EMC Met Plus based, uh, based Global Deterministic Model Verification System. It can be used to generate statistics and plots. Currently, it's using MET version 9.1.1, MET plus version 3.1.1. Um, if you saw Jason Lovett's presentation yesterday, you heard about the EMC verification system, or EVS, and development for that is currently underway. Um, and EVS will eventually replace, or I guess you can think of it as more EMC verifiable getting um, subsumed into EVS. Um, EVS will still, still use MET plus. Um, however, it will be using MET version 10.1.1 and MET plus version 4.1.1. So this is why I haven't upgraded EMC Verif Global to using these latest versions since we're going to be doing the same work twice here. Um, and then just two bullet points, uh, again, link to the GFS application webpage and then the link to the EMC Verif Global uh, job. So um, yeah, I guess I have a minute or so for questions, so happy to I don't know if there's any in the chat. Yeah, Mallory, you have you have a few minutes for questions. Um, there's one from Maria um, asking if there's a concerted effort to have consistent evaluation system for the GFS and FSS SFS in the future. Um, I think you know as we develop EVS, that you know EVS is going to morph along with UFS and all that development. So. Um, I guess that would probably be, you know, EBS is going to be a concerted effort for everything. Any other questions for Mallory? If you come up with something, look for my email down here um, in the bottom right hand corner. There is. Um, there's a yeah. question in the chat. I just wanted to mention. Yeah, Mallory, that question is, um, which platform is MetPlus installed? Uh, do you run your MetPlus on NOLA WCOS? Uh, well, so yeah, I mean, EMC Verifo supports a few different machines, WCOS being one of them, WCOS 2, our new supercomputer that literally went live hours ago. Um, and then you know, are the HPS machines uh, like Hera, Jet, and Orion is also, also supported um, as well. Yep, so Mallory runs those, it, it has support for all those systems. Um, Met Plus uh, also, Julie might be able to share the link to this. There, Met Plus is installed on um, on all of those systems in a common location uh, that's 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 used by um, NOAA folks who NOAA folks and others who have access to those systems. Hi Logan, thank you. I'm going to post a link to um, the existing builds page in the chat for folks to see where we have the latest um, version installed. Thank you very much, Julie.
All right. Um, take that as the last question and go ahead and move on uh, to our next presenter. Thank you, Mallory. Mm -hmm. uh, our next presenter is Marcel Carone, uh, also from NOAA EMC. Uh, he's going to be discussing uh, MetPlus-based evaluation of operational model forecasts for high-impact weather events. Sorry about that. It's taking a second. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's try that again. Okay, um, so I, sh I should be sharing. Sorry about that. Yeah, we can see your uh, okay. screen now. Cool, all right, so let me pull up the presentation. And that should be showing, does that work? Yeah, yeah cool. Okay, uh, awesome, thanks, Logan, uh, thanks, Mallory. So hi, uh, Marcel, as uh, Logan mentioned, and uh, I work at EMC as a member of the model evaluation group or the MEG led by Jeff Manikin. Um, that also includes Logan Dawson, who's chairing uh, the session, uh, Alicia Bentley, Shannon Shields, and formerly uh, Christopher McIntosh, whom, all of whom I want to acknowledge for contributing to the case reviews that I'm going to cover in this presentation. So the MEG uh, presents public case reviews of uh, model performance for recently occurring uh, notable weather events every Thursday, um, or has uh, every uh, few Thursdays in um, 2021. And so uh, these case reviews usually leverage a more subjective approach to model verification, like visual comparison between gridded forecasts and analysis um, to more easily provide specific information about why a forecast did well or, um, or where it went wrong. Um, and also to be more consistent with the forecasters' impressions of forecast value. But in response to a few audience requests last year, uh, uh, the MEG reviews combined these more subjective manual analyses with uh, more traditional automated verification metrics that were generated using MedPlus. And so we found that the reviews uh, approached the complex forecast problems that we were looking at with added dimensionality, but most of all, it they were just easier to communicate. So I wanna cover uh, a few of those cases. Um, and so I'll start with the methods that we use and I'll spend a lot of time talking about the, the, the Met Plus strategy um, uh, that was used to conduct the case reviews in 2021. And then I'll revisit two of the cases that we covered in 2021 before wrapping up. So to conduct each review, the MEG often outlined the type of verification the review should cover, and then downloaded gridded forecast analyses, created plots based on the chosen verification type, and prepared a review using visual comparison between selected plots on slides. And this is an oversimplification, but I think it, it does um, it follows sort of the typic, most typical MEG workflow, I'd say. And so the automated verification fit very well between downloading the data and generating the plots. And GridStat was the most useful MEG utility for, uh, for the, the automated verification component because it took in the data that we were already downloading, gridded um, forecasts and analyses. Um, so here's uh, my little flow chart for the MET workflow, and you can look at the top right, um, starting from uh, gridded forecasts um, and analyses that had already been collected by the MEG uh, were the inputs to the MEG MET plus work workflow. And the MEG 
prefers in, in many cases to use the model's own analysis as the reference grid, but um, there were uh, certainly exceptions, for example, for precipitation and near surface temperature. Uh, and I'll um, show one or two of those later on. And so the path the data then took depended on the type of verification that was being performed. And oftentimes gridded forecast analyses could be directly compared, but in some cases forecasts needed to be regridded to match the analysis grid. Uh, and precipitation verification always included a, a PCP combined step. And then grid stat was used to compute aggregated line type, so continuous contingency table, neighborhood statistics, um, et cetera, using the verification parameters that the MAGIT already defined, like verification domain, valuation period or periods, valid initialization times, et cetera. Um, and then just finally, SAT analysis could have been performed, but usually it wasn't because of the plotting scripts that uh, that we were using were capable of reading or were written to read grid stat output directly. But that would be a, a future step for sure. So the that was the the sort of the met path. And then just to see how that fit into the overall verification workflow, um, there were a few extra utilities that um, that were needed. Um, so first of all, a driver script uh, in orange here that was submitted, that submitted several Met Plus jobs to a workflow manager. And each of the jobs was usually set up for a specific model, but some larger jobs were broken up by lead time or accumulation. And then uh, in blue, three Met Plus configuration files were submitted with each Met Plus job. Um, the first um, is the sort of the general config file that was shared between all of the jobs that were submitted. And um, the second was unique to the machine in which Met was run. And that was really just Hera, but there's some flexibility to maybe move it to some other machines in the future. And the third file that was submitted with the Met Plus job was specific to the, the model that was being run for that job, um, or perhaps for an accumulation or a lead time, like I mentioned before. Then in red uh, was the grid stack configuration file, which just normally just inherited all of the, um, the variables that were defined in the Met Plus configuration files. Um, but there were uh, a few that were defined depending on the case. And one of those were the polygon files that were used to define the verification domain um, because that depended on the review that was being conducted. And so um, on that note, the, in purple is the polygon file. Um, and that was stored in a folder that was used that included other verification domains, but was usually um, defined specifically for for the review, for example, um, tropical cyclone Henri, um, uh, for the you know the QPF verification for that uh, cyclone in the northeast, we uh, defined a, uh, a square that we were looking at in the subjective verification uh, and defined it as a polygon here. So all of these files made up pretty much all of the automated verification and were included in the workflow according to the, the diagram on the right. And uh, a workflow like this one was created for separately for each verification type, uh, like precipitation, tropical cyclones, temperature, wind, et cetera. And the point was just to have very simple, ready to go workflow that was flexible enough to quickly create plots for each unique case review. And because the workflow was quite simple, most of the files could be adjusted directly as the settings changed for new case reviews. Um, but for most new reviews, the on, only the uh, general config file and the, and the polygons needed to be um, changed or defined. And finally, plotting was done using Python scripts that were developed in-house. So several case reviews conducted by the MEG in 2021 used this automated verification to communicate its results. Uh, wasn't the, the first time, but it was um, uh, kind of the, the start of a few consecutive um, case reviews that used um, Met Plus. And so I'm showing samples of two of these reviews that used the methodology I described. Um, and I grabbed these slides from our past presentations so you can all get a sense of 
the automated aspects of those reviews. And I kept the bullet points from those reviews, but just as a heads up, I'll, I'll mainly be referencing the plots that are shown as opposed to the text. Um, so the first of these reviews covered the historic heat wave at the end of June of 2021, which was characterized by the magnitude of its high temperatures over several days in the Pacific Northwest. And if you lived there, you will, uh, will probably remember that, or you might have remembered the images of, of trees drying up uh, going on online. There's a lot of discussion. So this was a, an interesting case to cover. And so as part of that review, the MEG made a visual comparison of forecasted two meter temperatures with analyses, some of which is shown here. Um, and in, in that sort of manual analysis uh, concluded that the high resolution modeling suite overall did well estimating the high temperatures um, west of the Cascades, which is the mountain range that kind of runs north and south along the center of, of these images of the Pacific Northwest. Um, with exceptions to the GFS and the FE3 based high res window, which was uh, the, the latter, which is shown in the upper right plot, um, uh, both of which overdid temperatures. So that was kind of the, the conclusion um, in that portion of the review. And then um, later, a performance diagram uh, showed model skill forecasting areas where the temperature exceeded 105 degrees Fahrenheit in the evening of the 29th of June in 2021. And uh, so frequency, but if you're not too familiar um, with, with this plot, um, uh, the performance diagram, the frequency bi bias contours are the dotted lines that fan outward from the lower left corner. Uh, and so over prediction would be the upper left half of the diagram. And the warm bias in the GFS and high res window um, FV3 indeed showed up as an over prediction. These are these, uh, the black and green um uh, markers um an over prediction of the the size of the hottest areas but the diagram also revealed that while the other models forecasted about the right temperatures overall they tended to underestimate the areas of hottest temperatures uh, particularly these um these other high-res window uh, models and in this case That's the so. performance yep yeah. we have about two minutes left Thanks. Um, so in this case, the performance diagram provided additional information about the model's overall temperature biases. And later in the summer, the MEG reviewed track forecasts and QPFs of tropical cyclone Henri. Um, and Henri took a very unusual track that's shown here in um, two different models. The left is the, the H wharf, on the right is um, HMON tracks. Um, these are different initialization times. The, the color, um, uh, uh, the bluer colors are later initialization times. Uh, I think this plot was created by uh, Logan Dawson. And um, so this was a very challenging case for the models to predict. And so track and intensity plots were used in the review to confirm what the visual analyses had already noted earlier in the review. For example, that the models overall had large right of track biases that increased with lead time. So this plot is track bias as a function of, of lead hour increasing towards the right. And um, uh, the models that kind of plot into the, the upper the portion of the plot um, have a right of track bias. And so that was, that was one main thing that was noted in the review, but these plots also highlighted some exceptions like the UK Met on the left plot in yellow, which had a slight left of track bias at um, some of these mid or shorter lead times. And that was also noted earlier in the, the subjective um, or manual analysis. And so additionally, in, this, in its coverage of low resolution 24 hour QPFs, the MEG showed that equitable threat scores on the left and frequency biases on the right um, also as functions of initialization time, varied widely from cycle to cycle. And for context, GEFS members initially wavered between two track outcomes overall, an offshore solution and an onshore looping solution, with each with dramatically different precipitation forecasts in the Northeast US. And so in this case, the visual comparison bet um, between the plots shown here in the three different initialization times of the, the GEFs ensemble um, provided nice details to the scale scores showing that 
forecast performed best when they chose the onshore track. And so to wrap up, uh, overall automated verification tended to describe overall model performance, which explained or was explained by the subjective verification, um, which in turn tended to describe details about model performance. We think automated verification provides a useful general picture of model performance for the often nuanced cases that the MEG reviews and MET Plus really allowed us to easily fit this into uh, this automated component of our reviews into our typical workflow. So it was very useful and we are looking forward to maybe using it in um, some future reviews once, once uh, we get back to them this year. So thank you. Thanks, Marcel. Um, note that Alicia Bentley, also a member of the MEG, uh, has dropped the MEG homepage into the chat there. Um, you can go there to see um, more information on the work that we do and some, some further examples like the presentations that Marcel has shown. Um, we'll go ahead and move on in the interest of time, but if you have a question, any questions for Marcel, feel free to drop those in the chat. Um, next, we have Michelle Harold from NCAR. Uh, she's going to be discussing newly added NetPlus capabilities within the UFS SRW application. So take it away, Michelle. All right, thanks, Logan. Sorry, she's getting all my windows situated. I'll see. Second, let me just share this. All right. All right, so um, assuming everyone can hear and see, I'll get started. Uh, thank you, Logan, for the introduction. Um, I want to thank all the co-authors that are listed here. Um, it was definitely a large scientific and technical lift to get NetPlus added into the UFS short range weather application. So thanks to all the folks listed here for their, for their efforts. And just a little bit of background before we jump a little bit more into the NetPlus based um, discussion. Uh, but NOAA is going to be using the Unified Forecast System short range weather application uh, for the future of their convective allowing modeling. Uh, specifically, that'll uh, be what the rapid refresh forecast system operational system is based on. And so it has been undergoing a lot of rapid development over the last several years. And a lot of us on this call know that a key component of the NWP development process is evaluating model output. And we do that obviously to assess the strengths and weaknesses, and that can then help inform future model development. So there has been a lot of work underway recently to integrate MET Plus uh, within the UFS short range weather application that will then allow the community to not only run the model, but then also uh, verify the model output to complete that end to end workflow. And so a lot of talk this week has been around the UFS metrics workshop that occurred um, in 2021. So within that workshop, a number of CAM based verification measures were outlined. Um, and so we do have a number of those measures that were identified for the different tiers available within the workflow now. And I'll go over that a little bit more in the coming slides. Uh, but basically by identifying those measures and then setting up a framework that will better allow developers and research researchers uh, to then conduct their own evaluations that can then help track performance of their innovations. Um, and so the current capabilities within the UFS short inter weather application workflow do allow for uh, both routine deterministic as well as ensemble and probabilistic verification as well. Um, and for those of you that have used MetPlus, you know that it is, it's fairly flexible and we've tried to build um, a system that can then allow for users to add verification based on what their needs and applications are. So a little bit more background and a little bit of a timeline on how this was all added to the workflow. Um, the MetPlus verification was added to what we call the develop, develop branch of the UFS or Inch Weather App Regional Workflow um, a little over a year ago in March of 2021. And that initial capability included deterministic verification only. Um, and over the last year or so, there have been a lot of updates and enhancements um, to help increase the flexibility and usability. Um, and then we've also included the um, ensemble and probabilistic verification as well. Um, and again, that had all been living in the developed branch um, as well as different forks and branches um, over the last year or so. Um, obviously, um, Verification requires observations, and so the workflow does provide the observations to pull, uh, be pulled from the NOAA HPSS. Um, however, we also obviously fully acknowledge that not a lot of people um, have access to NOAA platforms as well as the HPSS. Um, so we tried to pick 
um, observations, and I'll go over those in the coming slides, uh, that are free, freely and publicly available uh, via things such as like the NOAA Big Data Program, as well as like NOMADS and the FTP server. Um, so the workflow also supports providing user-specified locations for staging your observations, so then you can run the verification workflow with those staged observations. And this has been uh, thoroughly tested on NOAA's HERA as well as NCAR's Cheyenne platforms. And we will be looking to add more platforms um, in the coming year as well that are supported. And the verification was officially included now in the UFS Shore Interweather app, which was um, in version 2.0.0, which was actually just released last week. Um, so now um, the verification component is fully documented. Um, so you can access that via the link um, that I provided there via Read the Docs. And it provides an overview on how to set up the verification, a flowchart of what's included, and um, how you can modify and things like that. And then also I provided the link to the two code repositories, the first being um, the UFS Short Range Weather App, and then also the, what we call the regional workflow. And it's the regional workflow where all the MET plus configuration files and the scripts are. Um, so if you did um, want to go ahead and modify based on your needs and applications, um, you could um, fork or download the code and then make modifications. Um, as I mentioned before, we try to keep um, our implementation relatively discreet. So that way, if you wanted to implement new things, um, we tried to keep it fairly straightforward. So if you wanted to add um, new variables to pre-existing configuration files, you could do that. Or if you wanted to add um, a totally new use case, you could also do that as well. Um, so this is just a, a screenshot of the different tiers of verification that were um, established back at the UFS Metrics Workshop. Um, and we've tried, as I mentioned, to implement a number of at least um, the first tier and some of the second and third tier um, within the UFS Short Range Weather app. Um, there are three main projects that have helped fund this um, as well that are using um, the application heavily. Uh, the first being a NOAA OAR um, OAC funded project. This was um, the project that did um, a large number of the implementation of verification into the workflow and it was used for um, implementing and testing stochastic physics perturbations in the FE3 LAM. And so this allowed us to not only implement the deterministic verification, but also a number of ensemble and probabilistic verification um, type metrics as well. And then there's currently two DTC funded projects, one that's um, funded by UFS R2O looking at RFS benchmarking, um, as well as a NOAA OAR funded project to optimize RFS ensemble design. So there are definitely a number of projects that are using this, um, at least within um, NCAR and NOAA, and hopefully we'll get um, some more users along the way now that it's officially included um, in the release as well. Um, so what is ex exactly verified in the UFS Short Range Weather app? Um, on the left-hand table here, we have the grid to point verification. So we're using the NAM prep buffer data for these. And then on the right-hand side, we have the grid to grid verification where we're doing um, accumulated precipitation at different um, increments and intervals, uh, composite reflectivity and echo tap. And so we're using CCPA data for the accumulated precipitation and then the MRMS data for the um, composite reflectivity and echo tap. And I should mention that the, um, the variables in black indicate that deterministic verification is available in the workflow. And then the variables in red indicate that uh, deterministic and or ensemble or probabilistic verification is available in the workflow. And so, um, as I mentioned, um, a number of these are included in the different tiers, um, but we will be looking to add more through some, some funded projects. And um, I'll basically spend the remaining part of the presentation um, going through what tools we use in MET and then providing a lot of examples of, of the types of output that you can create um, from running the verification in the short range weather app workflow. Um, so currently we are using version 10.1 in the official release. Uh, we start with the gridded forecast data. And then um, as we discussed in the, the last couple slides, we have the gridded analyses, the CCPA data, as well as the MRMS data. And then we use the prep buffer point data. Um, so we do use some of those um, reformatting and pre-processing steps, the PCP combined uh, for the precip, and then also the PB to NC tool um, for the, the buffer data. Uh, we also use the regrid data plane tool to get the, the forecast and the analyses on the same grid. Um, and then from there, we run, um, can run deterministic verification where we use grid stat for the grid to grid verification and then point stat for the grid to point verification. Uh, currently in the released version, we're using ensemble stat for both the product generation as well as the ensemble stat um, calculations. Uh, we do have a branch uh, for when MET pivots to version 11 that will also use Genon's prod for the product generation for the ensemble portion and then ensemble stat for the um, ensemble stat um, calculations. Um, so when MET is upgraded, we, we will be ready to go for that. 
Um, and then we can also run some probabilistic verification um, after ensemble stat. And so we create a number of stat files, um, and then we load those into a MapViewer database, where then we create um, a large number of plots and different scorecards um, that can then help us um, analyze our model output better. Um, and I do want to say that we've uh, been using MapPlus in a lot of ways. And so we've, um, through these various projects that have helped fund this work, we've helped um, uh, provide some enhancements for MetPlus as well as some bug fixes. Uh, so I definitely want to thank uh, the MetPlus team who has been uh, very gracious with, with helping us out getting this integrated into the short range weather app workflow. Uh, so the first set of examples I'll show are from our RFS benchmarking. Um, and basically um, the goal of the RFS benchmarking uh, project was uh, to evaluate a very preliminary RFS like physics suite. Um, that would provide a baseline. So if there were innovations made as um, the operational implementation of the RFS move forward, uh, we have this, this benchmark or baseline of where we can uh, monitor progress from. And so this example on this slide is just some, um, some plots of temperature. On the, the left-hand side, we have two meter and near surface temperature. And we can break this down by different verification regions. So you can see we have CONUS, the east and then west domains. Uh, we're looking at both mean error as well as bias corrected root mean squared error. And so um, on the left-hand plot, um, we can also look at uh, different seasonal aggregations. So we have summer BCRMSE in the orange, and then winter BCRMSE in the tealish color. And then we have summer mean error in red and winter mean error in blue. So all these plots are by forecast lead time. Uh, so you can get an idea of how the skill um, as well as the error uh, change, if there's any diurnal signals or, or things like that. So this provide a great tool for a good first look at the data. Um, we can also look at vertical profiles. Uh, so on the right-hand side, we have uh, the warm season on top and the cool season on the bottom for um, upper air temperature. Um, and then we have um, both BCRMSE again and, and mean error. And we can look at it by forecast lead time. So the different color lines um, are different forecast hours. So you can see how the skill and error might change uh, through the model integration period. Um, and this example is just for temperature, but we have a number of other variables, as you saw, that we can also create very similar types of plots for. Uh, this example on this slide is for precipitation. So we have one hour accumulated precipitation. On the left side, we have things like uh, the mean forecast, which is in the reds, and then the mean observed values in the blue. So you can get an idea of, of over or under forecasting precipitation in different seasons by forecast lead time. Um, we also have neighborhood type methods. So we can look at fraction skill score. So on the right hand side, we have fraction skill score at different neighborhood sizes. So um, as we go from red to orange to green, we're increasing our neighborhood size. So you can get an idea of how well the forecast skill varies with spatial scale. Um, so again, these are all types of tools that are included um, that you can calculate and then create plots for in the workflow. Michelle, uh, you have yes. two minutes left. Perfect. All right, I'm just starting to wrap up. So um, next we have some um, examples from our stochastic physics testing so this is looking at the deterministic verification so in, in these types of plots we have mean error or bias uh, so you can plot the different members to get an idea of the envelope um, of the different scores um, in the middle we have gilbert skill score so precipitation one hour precip um, by threshold and then we also have some cape verification just looking at the, the mean forecast and observed values again to get an idea of performance compared to observations um, we can compute a number of ensemble verifications. We have um, spread skills. So the example on the left is spread skill for two meter temperature. We can also create rank histograms. The example here is for 10 meter wind speed. Then we can also compute a wide variety of probabilistic verifications. So we have a reliability and event histogram diagram here for one hour precip, um, rock diagrams, and then area under the curve here is for reflectivity at different thresholds. Um, and I should note that all these plots are created um, within MetViewer. And so we use both the GUI and the batch engine for creating these types of plots. Um, and then just to wrap up, I, I believe I briefly mentioned this, but we're hoping to add uh, support for additional platforms in the future, such as um, Jet, Orion, and NOAA Cloud platforms. Um, and we'll also be looking to add additional verification measures uh, that were outlined in the DTC UFS Evaluation Metrics Workshop. And then uh, when MET 11 gets released, we'll be shifting to use both Genon's prod and ensemble stat. And you can see an example here on the right-hand side of using the uh, neighborhood maximum ensemble probabilities with Genon's prod. And I do want to acknowledge, um, in addition to the co-authors, we had a number of folks from both EMC, uh, like Logan, Perry, Yan, Ying, Jacob, and Chan Hu, who were very helpful with providing us information on the types of verification EMC uh, does so we can make sure we include that. 
And then I also want to extend a big thanks to the MEP Plus crew, George and John and Julie and Tara and others um, for their, all of their help with collaborating and um, integrating MEP Plus into the, the regional workflow. So um, it was a, a big group effort um, and many thanks to all those who were involved. All right, thank you, Michelle. Um, we've got time for a question, uh, if, if anyone has one. You do have one, one there in the chat. What is Jen okay. Ons Prod? Uh, Jen Ons Prod, um, so, and I'm not sure, there's, there's probably met folks on here that could answer that better than myself, but um, they, I believe the MET group is splitting up Ensemble Stat, which currently does both um, ensemble product generation and then calculates the ensemble statistics. Um, they're kind of breaking that up into two tools. Um, the Gen Ons Prod tool will be the tool that does the um, ensemble product generation and then um, ensemble stat will continue doing the ensemble statistic calculation. But again, um, I'm sure there's somebody who knows far more about that who can answer that better. So feel free to jump in. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Michelle. All right, and our final speaker of this session is John Wagner from NOAA. Um, he'll be discussing MDL's utilization of MET and verifying operational forecasts. All right, thanks, Logan. Uh, attempting to share my screen. Every day it seems to take a little longer to share it. I understand that. <laughs> All right, there we go. We can see it there. Great. Uh, let me start by acknowledging my colleagues in the verification group here at MDL. Um, and we'll start talking about how we've been using MET at MDL. Um, so we started using MET around 2017 uh, in verifying uh, six-hour QPF uh, scores. Um, that became a project known as QPFVS or QPF Verification Service. Uh, which was implemented in 2018 and was available for a little while uh, on the MDL servers. Uh, but starting in 2019, we transitioned transition to using uh, MET to verify all of our forecasts. Um, all of our routine verifications started in 2020, and we have a new viewer, uh, the link is there, um, that'll allow you to look at um, all of the verification we do currently. Um, you do need a, uh, a CAC card in order to log in, though. Uh, so quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. Um, basically, have four categories of verification that we do. Um, gridded daily forecasts, gridded monthly forecasts, station daily forecasts, and station monthly forecasts. Um, our daily forecasts are verified uh, not only every day, but every hour. Um, and our gridded forecasts are, are Monthly forecasts are verified once a month, usually around the uh, 15th of the following month. Here is our um, MET overview slide for gridded verification highlighted in red um, are the parts of MET that we are currently using for both uh, daily and monthly um, verification. Um, our daily gridded uh, process breaks down to five steps, and you can see here how different pieces of MET fall into each of those steps. Um, so the first step is to create our data archive. Um, we keep a GRIB2 archive on WCOS. Um, the majority of the data comes from the COM and DCOM area on WCOS and now WCOS2. Um, that includes the models that typically run on WCOS, like the National Blunder Models, GFS, et cetera. Um, we have two sources that we download from FTP servers, and those are uh, the NDFD and WPC forecasts. And we have a couple sources that are made available to us on WCOS for verification. Um, that includes the blend parallel um, and some WPC, QPF, and snow forecasts. Uh, it's worth noting that as we build our archive, the, the IRMA QPF grids, we don't archive in real time. We archive them on seven-day delay. Um, that's to wait for any updates um, to those from the RFCs. And um, that seven-day delay does affect when we run our uh, monthly verification. Second step is to create match samples. Uh, we want to make sure that we have data from all of our sources before doing any verification. And we have four different match samples that we use. Um, NDFD statistics is our, our flagship uh, verification product. 
Uh, that includes elements like temperatures and winds and QPF. Um, and we typically verify uh, the NDFD and the models that are available um, to the forecasters when they're making their NDFD forecasts at the times that they are making them. So let's say we are verifying the 12Z NDFD. Um, we'll compare the 1Z or 7Z blend to that, um, the 0Z GMOS or the 0Z WPC, uh, whatever the, the forecasters would have available to them at the time that they made the forecast. Um, I've mentioned QPFVS already, and that's just QPF06 um, verification for um, a few more sources than we have available for NDFD stats. Uh, we also have an aviation product uh, that focuses on short-term verification, usually up to 24 or 30 hours. Um, that includes um, elements that are um, applicable to aviation um, forecasting and includes a couple extra models like GLAMP, the GFS, and HER. Uh, we're also part of the QPF Collaborative Forecast uh, product um, that's look, currently going on looking at um, different QPF and snow forecasts. Um, so that's, uh, we get a couple extra sources from there, including ECMWF's forecasts. Um, but worth noting, if not all sources are available for any given um, matching case, we don't verify that case. Uh, step three is to pre-process the data. Uh, like many of you, we use regrid data plane to um, put our, our grids on a, a common grid and uh, convert them to NetCDF files. Um, we also use PCP combined when we need to generate um, QPF forecasts for, say, QPF01 or 24 hours. Uh, we also have a Python intercept, intersect script that we use. Um, that's something that just ensures that um, all grid points are common to all sources. Um, not something that we really need to worry about now, but we have verified sources in the past that have not been complete grids. So it was uh, important that we had the same number of grid points on every grid that we verified. Um, we do some pre-processing also on our wind grids. Um, we verify wind speed and gust if any grid point on any grid for any source exceeds eight knots. Um, we do the same for wind gusts with a threshold of 14 knots. Um, we also started to verify something we call the high impact event review or higher. Uh, this uses the NDFD Wawa grids to create masks associated with any watch warning and advisory um, and allows us to um, mask out areas that are affected by those Wawa's. Um, and we use that Python intersect script to create that mask and apply it to all the sources. Um, so step four is to run GridStat itself. Uh, we do this a couple different ways. Um, we um, compare the source directly to Irma. We do this for all sources. And we save a bunch of outputs um, and the outputs that we save are ones that we need for both um, daily ingest into our database and things that we'll need to run monthly verification at the end of the month. Um, we're current, currently verifying 191 masks. Um, the vast majority of those are in the CONUS, and these include things like uh, each WFO. Um, each WFO, if they have a, a water area that they're responsible for, we include that. Different regions, RFCs, and of course the full CONUS, and um, Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico as well. We're also computing a mean absolute difference, which is the difference between a source, in this case either the blend or WPC, um, to the NDFD. Um, and this allows um, forecasters to see how their forecasts, um, how the changes that they're making to the NDFD are affected um, and determine whether or not they're actually adding information or not um, from the blend or WPC. And then we also do a third run um, for hire if, uh, if a Wawa was found and that again, uh, saving those same sources for a smaller mask in this instance. And then the post-processing step that we do at the end is really just to get the data into our database for display. Uh, we use Python scripts to flip the data around, put it in the format that we need. Um, we are synced the, the data once a day and then ingest it once a day. 
Um, all right, so we'll move on to gridded monthly um, verification. This is a three-step process that uses stat analysis. So the first step um, is to just pre-process the data and make sure that we have all the data that we expect for the month. Uh, we start this on the 15th of the month. Uh, we wait for all the forecasts issued during a month to verify. So um, seven and eight day forecasts issued on the last day of the month. We need to wait a couple of days for the IRMA to come in, wait even longer for the QPF IRMA to come in after that. Um, so that's why we start on the 15th. Um, and then we do again check all of our match samples um, just to make sure that we have all the data we expect. Um, a step that really shouldn't be necessary, but anybody that works on WCOS knows um, when you have production switches and dev outages, it can it can be a challenge to um, keep uh, track of all the data that you have. Um, so then we run stat analysis. We do two different runs of stat analysis. Um, we do what we call on our viewer either issued at or issued for. Um, and issued at is just simply um, all the forecasts that were issued during a given month based on how they matched with NDFD. And then issued for is all the data that was valid during a given month. And we break the data up to as best we can to reduce the wall clock times. Um, we use MPI run and soon MPI exec to do this. On uh, WCOS 1, um, breaking this down to about 36 to 40 tasks per node currently. Uh, looking forward to speeding that up on WCOS 2. Um, looks like we could use up to 128 tasks per node. And we break the data up by the mass that we're using, um, break them into groups, and then run them in parallel. Um, so the monthly pros processing, very similar to the daily pros processing only um, we need to now concatenate the data that we um, had broken up in the previous step, put it all back together and or sync it to AWS to be ingested so you could see it on our viewer. All right, moving on to station verification. Again, here is our flow chart showing the parts of MET that we are using. Um, station verification ends up being a, um, a four uh, step process. Um, we don't push daily station data to our web page. Um, it just turns out it's a lot of data and it fills databases very quickly. Um, so we'll start again with creating the data. I'll highlight in red the pieces of, um, of what is different between um, gridded data and station data. So for the station data, we're using a METAR archive of the surface tables and also grabbing MEDIS data for QPF along with all the other sources that we use for gridded data. Um, when we do match samples, we're again looking at those station observations to make sure they're there. Um, we only do three different types of match samples. We don't do a station uh, version of the CFP, um, but we do add IRMA as a source um, for each verif type that we do. Um, this is done so we have a comparison between the, uh, the OBS and IRMA. When we pre-process, we start by using CAMPS, which is the Community Atmospheric Model Post Processing System. This was an update um, to MOSS that we had used previously to QC all our OBS. Um, once we run CAMPS, we then convert the data that CAMPS gives us to ASCII and use ASCII to NC um, to put it in a NetCDF file um, for use in PointStat. When we run point stat, um, we're now comparing our sources to the different stations. Um, since we don't uh, ingest daily into the database, we only need to save um, the stat outputs that we need to keep for monthly verification. So shortens our list there, um, but we have um, considerably more stations than we have gridded mass, so it does take a bit longer. Uh, we currently have over 2,900 stations that we're verifying. Uh, the vast majority of those are in the CONUS. Um, we also group the station together into different station aggregates. Um, so we have 155 aggregates that we're using currently. Um, again, the majority of them being in the CONUS. And then once we have our monthly data ready, uh, we'll go ahead and run stat analysis for that. Um, so again, the pre-processing steps are the same as gridded. Um, when we do run stat analysis for uh, station data, we do break things up a bit more. 
um, because we have more stations and more station aggregates that need to be run. So we run them um, in parallel using MPI. Um, and QPF06, we actually break up even further. Um, we have eight, eight different thresholds that we use for QPF. So we run each threshold independently. And then again, it's concatenate the data and get it into the database to view. And you can find our um, the link for our database, our, our viewer here as well. Um, here's a couple images of what they look like. Um, if you're interested in all in viewing our data, um, I will be happy to give you a demonstration of that as well. That's a bit longer of a presentation, um, but available upon request. Um, and I think we're actually doing a demo next month as part of the um, VLAB series. So you can look for us there too. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, we've got time for questions, if anyone has any. All right, well, not hearing any. Um, I'll go ahead and um, thank our speakers, uh, all of our excellent spe speakers for this session. Um, we'll go ahead and conclude there and give everyone an extra five minutes of break time. Uh, so thank you again to the speakers and we'll see everyone back uh, in our next session uh, at the bottom of the hour. Thank you. <laughs>